Opportunity. Because for me, you know, I opened the store when I was 27, now I'm 51, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, opened the store when I was 27, I had a lot of friends that were in their early 20s, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But I was a mama's boy, my grandmama, you know, she mm -hmm. died a couple of years ago, she was 102 years old. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted a space that I could kind of speak to the 20 year old and the 90 year old, mm -hmm. you know. And the block mm -hmm. party is that same, very intentional. When I hear people say, you know, that the daughter went, the mama went, and the grandmama went, and they all had a good time, that's the biggest compliment because that's done on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I want to have something for everybody because, you know, in our culture, a lot of cultures, you see it's all for young people or it's all for, for elders, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Not many events. And we say, when we say all ages, usually all ages actually means like young people, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, but again, I know people tell me that was the time that they could go with their, their kid, their high school kid, mm -hmm. and they could actually bond over something. They go to, and the high school kid wanted to go with them. Now, they might go do their own thing, but they wanted to go together. When they leave, they both had fun. And so yeah. that is actually the purpose of this event. Hey, hello. I want to welcome you all to another episode of Cricket Courage, where we tell the story of everyday people. We are so excited today to have on our show Eric Williams. He is the founder and the manager and the whatever else, the <laughs> HNIC of the Silver Room. So I have to say, I, I really, really, really like the Silver Room. I'm kind of maybe biased and I don't, and I was thinking about this, I don't even have words, but it's just like, I like walking in there. I like the vibe. I like the feeling. I like the merchandise. So tell me, how did the silver room, because I'm about to say spoon. <laughs> Don't say spoon. How did the silver room um, get born? Like, sure, sure. Yeah, where did this come from? Um, I could probably start, I guess, with the history, which I was just talking about with my father. Mm -hmm. My father was an entrepreneur. He owned a place called um, Manny's Blue Room mm -hmm. in Robbins, Illinois. I'm from Robbins, Illinois. Mm -hmm. I was born in Harvey. Um, so I grew up in this bar, and I always enjoyed going down there, seeing people dance, and Herb Kent was one of his first DJs. Mm -hmm. So I remember like the magic of music and just people, you know, gathering and late nights. So I always kind of had that in me. And then my uncle actually played uh, j jazz. He played bass for Sun Rock. Mm -hmm. And so I remember like just that side of, and that was my, that was, that was my mother's um, brother. And so we always had music in the family. Um, my father had this cultural space. And so um, as I got older, I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with myself. And I wanted to go into business so I could make some money. Because at the time, it was back in the 80s, I got really into house music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my idea was to open up a nightclub. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I can go get, you know, start a business, make some money in finance, and open up a nightclub. Because so I was DJing and just, you know, just mm -hmm. all of this 80s, mm -hmm. 80s arts and culture. And so uh, I went to UIC down by Maxwell Street. And so mm -hmm. I met somebody who was really involved in Maxwell Street. He's always buying stuff from there. He got me to start buying stuff from Maxwell Street and I started selling stuff uh, to the students and then mm -hmm. just like around Chicago, Rush Street, you know, mm -hmm. Chicago Avenue on the trains. So while I was in school for finance, I was actually street, street peddling also. So mm -hmm. that's how I paid for my school. And then once I got out of school, I was a stockbroker for like a very short time, I, mm -hmm. less than a year. Mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't really take it. I quit my job, I didn't have a job, and so I went back to street vending, to street peddling. And I was selling socks, this is back when the Bulls were winning championships, I was selling like bootleg Bulls t-shirts and you know, watches and you know, socks and you know, you name it. I was the guy on the corner selling stuff, you know? And I said I'll do this for a couple of years or a year, and then that turned into one year, turned into two years, turned into almost 10 years. And wow. then I started traveling around the country. I was printing up T-shirts, going to mm -hmm. you know, Freaknik in Atlanta and Carabon in Toronto. And um, I was printing up black college football sweatshirts. I mean, I was just, I was into street vending. Mm -hmm. And I did it for a long time. And then I moved to Wicker Park back in the mid-90s. And I still had a love, for obviously, for art and culture, but I had to make money. Mm -hmm. And so I found a space called Lit X. Well, this guy I knew, actually, he actually asked me to put my stuff in his store on consignment. And so I found my way to the space that was a really cool spot. This was mm -hmm. back in 95. Mm -hmm. And this was back time of poetry and, mm -hmm. you know, all mm -hmm. of the early hip hop, everybody had dreads, you know, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. Love Jones kind of vibe. So I was selling my stuff out of this space um, and also kind of really into this arts and culture thing. So this is when Wicker Park was starting to kind of change a little bit. And 
this is in 97, I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my own space now. So I found a space down the street uh, in Wake Up Park mm -hmm. and opened up the store. So it was really uh, informed by this, my love of arts and culture mm -hmm. and also me being a street vendor. The first year, basically, I just took stuff I was selling on the streets and just put it in the store. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the stuff I have right now. It was just kind of like kind of cheaper stuff, you know. But I had a story, you know. And then um, that was it. I worked every day for probably, you know, the first year or two. Then mm -hmm. I cut down the six six days a week for probably the next 15 years mm -hmm. and just built the space up, you know, mm -hmm. from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, DJing, me DJing, my friends are DJing. They would come in the store and play records. My friends were artists. They would come in and do art shows. I had, just, mm -hmm. I had a lot of artist friends. So it was like always this like art kind of thing, but always like me trying to find newer and nicer stuff. Then I would travel around the country mm -hmm. and just find jewelry from around the world. Um, mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun. And, you know, and then you meet people who make things and, so gradually the merchandise, the quality got a lot better, <laughs> you know, from when it started at, you know, because I didn't have a lot of money either, so I couldn't mm -hmm. afford to buy a lot of mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Um, and yeah, it's been 23 years later. So we went to Northside for 17 years in Wicker Park, mm -hmm. and we've been in Hyde Park for about six years now. Actually, it's like almost actually exactly six years. I think we moved in in April. Right, so, yeah. right. So, like, when you started street vending, how, how, was that sustainable income? You were able to pay your bills by selling merchandise on the street. How did that work for you? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was good during the summer. Mm -hmm. In the winter, not so much. So that's kind of why I got, you know, as I got older, I'm like, okay, I can't keep doing this. It was like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd make a lot of money during the summer, you know, and I'd save up, you know, during the winter. And then, you know, I would do the... No, the, the football games. So I make a little bit of money during the winter for football games. I do the basketball games. So I could find these little events to do throughout the year. And Christmas, I would do well. Mm -hmm. I do okay for, for Valentine's Day, you know. But, you know, I was a, a street man out, out, out in the elements. You know, I just didn't want to do that the rest of my life. So right, right, eventually, right. I wanted to move inside. But I was, I survived. I look back now, like, I don't know how I did it, but I survived for 10 years um, yeah. just on the streets, you know, so... Oh, that's pretty amazing. We have a lot of street vendors right on our church. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you know. <laughs> I, that, that was that was one hundred percent me. That was a, that that was me uh -huh. for ten years at yeah. the table. It's funny. I, actually, I found a photo because my mom passed away a couple of years ago, and we were mm -hmm. going through my the old photos from my dad. I actually found a photo of me and my father. I had my shirts right in front of the shed aquarium. Mm -hmm. I had t-shirts like tourists at like Chicago, mm -hmm. home of the blues. I had these like tourist t-shirts mm -hmm. on the ground. I just found this 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 photo. Um, so that's proof that was that was out there, man. Did you ever get any negative energy being a street vendor? Oh, of course. <laughs> you know, of course. I mean, but you know, you get way more positive than negative. Okay. I mean, some people okay. will come by and like look down on you, and mm -hmm. uh, you know. But then you get people who would be super nice. Hey, I'll be. I had spots in the neighborhood, you know. Mm -hmm. So on Chicago Avenue Rush, I was there like all the time. That's like my main location was on Chicago Avenue Rush. Mm -hmm. So people would see me all the time, and then they would like you know. Some of the people, hey, how you doing? They'd buy stuff. And I was always nice to everybody and friendly. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, you had some people like, ah, oh, you just a little street dude or, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. take stuff. But I, I remember this one guy, this business guy, because at that location, you get people from the Gold Coast, you get mm -hmm. people get, you know, on the red line going to the west side, you mm -hmm. got students over yeah. there, you, you have suburban a hybrid of That yeah. location mm -hmm. at Chicago Avenue and State and Rush was a really interesting mix of people. You got mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. But this one business guy would always walk past. He'd always have a suit and tie on. He'd see me out there every day. He'd walk past and one day he goes, you out here every day. I'm like, yeah. He goes, do you remember me asking? He said, how much do these shirts cost? And I was like, they cost three bucks. And he said, how much do you sell them for? I'm like, let's sell them for $10 at the time. Mm -hmm. He was like, he was like looking at the traffic. He goes, you could sell three per hour. I'm like, yeah. He goes, that's 20 bucks an hour. Minimum wage at the time was three thirty-five an hour. Mm -hmm. He's like, he like, he just he kind of got it. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, this guy is, is actually doing better than you doing if you worked a minimum wage job. Yeah. Or even at the time, ten bucks an hour. This is yeah. back in the you know late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Mm -hmm. So I never forget that he he was a guy that kind of figured out like this actually is not that bad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but it was a great experience because I got a chance to meet all different kinds of people, and to this day, I'm like, I know how to get along with everybody. Yeah, from that yeah, experience you yeah know. yeah I appreciate hearing the like evolution because a lot of times people see people that are successful and they're like how did they do that how mm -hmm. you know we don't get the in-between steps 
you know, I was talking to the owner of Wesley, which is like the number one independent shoe store, and it's a, a black brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was like, we used to sell cheap shoes, <laughs> you know? Right, And then right. we graduated. Now those shoes are like expensive, right, <laughs> you know? Right, but right, right, But it depends on how much you love your feet. So, um, so how do you choose your merchandise? Like I bought, uh, a friend of mine came in from Atlanta and she was like, I got to go to this shop. So she wanted to um, mm -hmm. come over to the silver room. And I bought this shirt that says good hair. Like, I, mean, <laughs> I made that you, you shirt, can, actually. Yeah. That you was get my it. design. Really? So there's a story behind that shirt. So my daughter, uh, her mom is Indian. Mm -hmm. And so when she was born, she had like straight, like very long curly hair. And at a very early age, I'm talking like when she started to be able to talk, like, you know, really you know, very vocalize her feelings, three, mm -hmm. four years old. Mm -hmm. People come up to her and like, girl, you got some good hair. And she was too young to understand what that, understand what that really meant. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, why does everybody say I have good hair? I'm like, I don't know. And, and it got, it kind of irritated her and bothered her. Mm -hmm. She's like, dad, everyone has good hair. And I'll never forget that. I'm like, you're right. Everyone has good hair. Like, what does that mean? That we mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. grade people's hair. Um, and so I just, that kind of stuck with me. So the, 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 the message behind that was like, everybody has good hair. Even if you don't have any hair, right, right, you have right. good hair, and yeah. it's, it's just hair. Like it's not, you know, it shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be the definition of who we are. So that was a statement behind that. Is like we all have good hair. Yeah. So I love yeah. wearing it because yeah, you know yeah. it just it speaks for itself. So when you say you design that shirt, like how does that work? Do you send it off to a company? Do you just get some words and you send a, a image off? Well, with a lot of the we don't design all the shirts. We probably about a third of them uh, mm -hmm. because I was a street peddler. Peddler. I used to print t-shirts, so I actually had my own printer. So it's a physical printer myself, four mm -hmm. four color printer. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I actually sold it, but we have I have a person who actually prints my shirts for me now. Mm -hmm. So I'll come up with an idea, and either I'll work on some basic graphics. I send it to a, to a graphic designer, and then she or he will kind of like mm -hmm. interpret my image of what that would look like. Like with that one, I wanted it to be very straightforward. Like certain, it wasn't any like imagery illustration. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I wanted it to be very clear what this means, mm -hmm. and we'll kind of mock up some stuff. We'll maybe do two or three different designs and okay mm -hmm. cool mm -hmm. and i'll go to my printer and we'll print it i'll order shirts we'll print it we'll print mm -hmm. it up mm -hmm. uh, some of the stuff is made by people who like come into the store and say hey i got a t-shirt line or i make jewelry what do you think we'll look at it if it makes sense okay cool i look at price point i look at style mm -hmm. uh quality is number one mm -hmm. um the a or nay you know um and i also travel well, i used to travel <laughs> and to trade shows and around the world so i've been a probably 30 countries, you know, Germany, mm -hmm. China, you know, Mexico. So when you decide you want a product, do you buy it then and there or do you just get a card from someone and order from them when you get back home? Um, it depends. I mean, like a lot of, it depends on how it's made. Some things we actually create together and we, and so we make it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's somebody we meet in New York who has a certain kind of design. I might say I want this, but I want it done this way with this mm -hmm. color, blah, blah. So we'll make sometimes we we'll make things just for our store. Mm -hmm. um, and then that might take, you know, when you shop in fashion, the season is like two seasons ahead. Mm -hmm. So right now we're buying for fall, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, we can kind of tweak it. I want this color, this many, blah, blah, blah. Or sometimes people just have stuff and we'll just say, okay, I'll take two of these, three of these, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, it's both. Yeah, yeah. It's both. So, yeah. So I wanted to know, how do you decide what goes into your store? Like mm -hmm. I've seen it evolve, but how do you make that decision? Because there's a lot of good stuff out here that looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you decide yeah. this is coming in my store? Well, you know, in the fashion industry, there's there's buyers who have different metrics they look at. You know, trend forecasting, color swatches, you know, all that stuff. And I don't really do that. I mean, I tried it one time, and it was like I, it was like the worst buying season I've ever had. I just go mm -hmm. by feeling, honestly. Mm -hmm. So I buy based upon. Uh, uh, avatars or images of people that I see, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, I look at you. Mm -hmm. You know, you have beautiful, you know, pepper gray hair. You have earrings. You have this good hair shirt. I can look at how you dress and how you are, mm -hmm. and I'll think about things that you might like mm -hmm. because I know that there's probably 50 women who are similar in style and fashion like mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll think about like a high school girl or boy who went to Kenwood. Mm -hmm. What's their style like? They might like a different kind of glasses. You know, they might like different kind of style. So I'll, I'll kind of think of maybe five to ten different kinds of people. Um, and I'll kind of buy for those people. But it all, all still has to be cohesive within mm -hmm. that. So it's not like just crazy. It all has to kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. And I'll, so that's one way I'll do it. Like, so even with earrings. So I'll buy hoops. 
Mm -hmm. I'll buy little studs. I'll buy like different kinds of earrings. Mm -hmm. So that way maybe four or five different people can find a pair of earrings, you know. Uh, and then I'll buy cross categories, you know, like mm -hmm. the sunglasses and like we've introduced like books, if you notice. We didn't really have a lot of books before. Right. Um, I've been noticing. I mean, I love books. So now yeah. you're hooking me because I'm like, wow, they well, got the books Sicily are, in here. Like, I mean, so how, what what caused you to say, hey, I'm going to grow this? Well, because it was small. Yeah. Well, we, we had two, three, four, five titles. The books directly a direct response to George Floyd, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and coronavirus. So when we closed, we closed for three months. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really have a, a, a very strong online presence. We had an a, a, um, e-commerce presence. Mm -hmm. So when we closed, I had to lay everybody off. We had seven people we had to furlough. I kept on my manager and my mm -hmm. person does my social media and e-commerce. So I'm like, well, we closed now. We can just put everything online. So we just, man, just every day, just photographing everything, writing everything. I mean, we mm -hmm. actually got a whole new website. Mm -hmm. And so we had to kind of, you know, had it evolve from the retail space into, into the um, online. So we start, you know, same day doing same day pickup, mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. come by the store. That transition took about two months to do do all of that. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, after George Floyd, you know, there was a lot of talk about race and conversations about race. Mm -hmm. And I read a lot, and I, you know, I'm looking through the New York Times, and I'm seeing all these books that are like trending, like you know, mm -hmm. uh, white fragility. How to be anti-racist, mm -hmm. hood feminism, mm -hmm. you know, all the books on race. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, when we open, like, you know what, people are really interested in these books on race. Like, let me just order some. Because we already had relationships with these, with these publishers anyway. Mm -hmm. We just never really bought books. And so I ordered like literally probably five of each book and put them up and they sold out right away. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I ordered 10 of each book. But I sold right away. Then I'm like, let me just add on a couple other ones, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I mm -hmm. added two more titles, and then also, then I'm like, let me get three more. And then mm -hmm. I was seeing that people were interested in books in general that were just beyond mm -hmm. race, mm -hmm. and um, so I started ordering like the New York Times bestsellers that I that I liked that I actually mm -hmm. was interested mm -hmm. in reading, and those started selling. And then I started you know, going to the classics, you mm -hmm. know, Toni Morrison or uh, mm -hmm. Maya Angelou or mm -hmm. Octavia Butler or you know. Uh, Richard Wright, you know, just all like the classics, you know, Tar mm -hmm. Baby and Sula and Kindred. So mm -hmm. those start selling. Then I added on uh, art books, you know, the Basquiat mm -hmm. books, like the mm -hmm. big, the big, those books are $100, $150 books, you know, mm -hmm. and those start selling. And I'm like, people want to read books because people are inside. And you, you're looking at what people are doing while they're at home. Mm -hmm. uh, our candle selection exploded because candles are the number one thing right now. If you look up like what's the number one accessory in the, in the world, really? it's actually candles. Really? Yeah, so we had candles before. We sell so many candles now because what are people doing? They're at home. They're fixing their house mm -hmm. up. They're yeah. burning candles. They're reading books. Mm -hmm. So I'm just providing you what you're going to get anyway. Mm -hmm. Just get it from me. So that's kind of how I look at it, you know. So really it's a response to what people are looking for. But how can I put it, my own little twist on it? We actually make our own candles now. We have mm -hmm. different neighborhood candles. I made, this, I made it, I started a Southside candle line. Mm -hmm. So we have Inglewood, we got Kenwood, they're different names of, of neighborhoods. Now, so how, I mean, how do you decide I'm going to make a candle? You start looking up what it's made of? I mean... Uh, you know, because I've been doing this, from, from, doing this for 25 or more now. The store's mm -hmm. been 23 years, plus another 10 years of tree pill. I just, I know how to get everything made. You know, you, everything can be made, you know, candles, sunglasses, blah, blah, blah. So now I know people who pour candle wax. You know, I, I know the processes, you know. And so now I'm like, okay, well, we can just make our own candles. I can buy other people's, but I can create my own candle line. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a candle line that was going to speak to the south side. So I made High Park, Kenwood, Woodlawn. Hot. Woodlawn hot. smells like pine. South Shore smells like mm -hmm. the sea. You know what I mean? So kind of thinking about how that, that could look, you know. Um, and those have been selling like crazy. So part of it is like, most of it is like just things that I like, to be honest with you. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've always been into fashion. My mom was into fashion. Mm -hmm. As a little kid, I'm reading Vogue magazine and Mademoiselle and, you know, just like all these like fashion magazines. I've always had a, a mm -hmm. passion for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I still do. I still read a lot of stuff on women's, women's fashion, probably more so than men's fashion, honestly. Because it's just more money, out there. Right? No. <laughs> well, it's just more out there in general. Okay. But I mean, this is some good men's fashion now, too, which is relatively a newer thing. Mm -hmm. And I just like people being happy, like hearing you mm -hmm. happy with your purchase. That, that makes me happy, you know? Yeah. My friend boy the incense and I want to know did you make that I think you made those names uh, I don't make the, this other guy makes yeah right. you know the name I ain't gonna say it here names. But, I'm uh, really like very interesting story so that guy he's from <laughs> those are all handmade all hand dipped incense mm -hmm. he is from it's funny I'm actually gonna do a podcast with him because he has an interesting story mm -hmm. he's from Trinidad I believe okay. and he is tatted up he's like an older guy he's probably in his 60s mm -hmm. 
uh, but he's all tats on his head, there's all mm -hmm. tattoos. And he just started like making incense, mm -hmm. like hand dipped incense. Mm -hmm. And they're like the best incense. We sell so many incense. Yeah, well, she bought the incense and we all had a conversation on the names. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he makes all those, all those names up. So actually, I'm having him make incense for us. It's okay. going to be called Silver Room Essential. So I'm like, I wanted my own scent. So we're actually in the middle of right now making our own scent. And scent that's, so. that's, that's good. Yeah. Have you tried? There's a guy out here on our strip oh, yeah, that yeah. sells incense. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, know, I you come bought some here. of his incense too? I, 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 man, I have to buy from street peddlers. You know what I mean? So I, I go, I buy the cookies, I buy the street, you know, I buy all this stuff. Yeah. I don't know what the stuff happens. I just, I didn't know how it is. I got to right. buy from them because that was me, you know, right. 23 years ago. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, you know, I was um, having this reflection the other day that there are more um, African-American movies that are coming out that we can feel really proud of, mm -hmm. right? That quality is not just a one single narrative that we know we do drugs. Not that that's a bad narrative. It's just mm -hmm. there's more narratives out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when Black Panther came out, people were proud. And now you, you had Harriet Tubman. And then this year, you know, you have the Black Messiah, Judas and the Black Messiah. You know, you have some mm -hmm. good movies and people feel proud of them. I think also naturally African-Americans feel proud of black business owners that are mm -hmm. successful. Um, is that a responsibility for you as a black business owner? Do you feel like you carry a weight or you mm -hmm. have to represent in That's terms of- That's a really good question. Uh, I feel it more now than before. Mm -hmm. I think the first 10 years, I was just trying to stay in business. You know, you're not thinking about, you know, how mm -hmm. people look at you, but I'm on the other side of 50 now, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, people mm -hmm. come and they want to bring their classes to mm -hmm. the store so mm -hmm. they can see a black business owner. To hear these students say, I've never seen a black business owner before, to me it sounds kind of crazy, but I hear all the time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and just the idea of service, you know, I was just on this call, I can get a little frustrated, you know? The idea of us giving great service, you know, and knowing our history, you know, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. from the, the porters, the Pullman porters, to mm -hmm. us as people who like, give good service and deserve and want good mm -hmm. service that's really important to me you know mm -hmm. and so this idea of being a a, a person that represents something it, it is important so i know we have to mm -hmm. embody that you know and now i'm not really in the store a whole bunch at all right. so now i have to kind of let my employees know like look, look you know if you're going to work here this is how you got to work this is how you got to speak to people this kind of you know, music we're going to play the way you're going to dress because it's not just about this store mm -hmm. culturally for me it's about set an example for other people to say, oh, wow, this dude is, is successful, the store is successful, you have a certain kind of vibe. Now, we got to kind of, what we were doing wasn't working, let's do this, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I want to be able to shop at other places and go to restaurants and have great service from our people. Yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah, yeah, it's very important. I mean, we, yeah. in fact, just today we have, um, when I leave out of here, we have uh, two interns starting mm -hmm. and they're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And I know the average 18 year old on the South Side, I mean, they don't have any experience. They don't mm -hmm. really know a whole bunch, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, it's actually me teaching them how mm -hmm. to run a business, how to do certain things, how to present when it comes to graphic design mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. visual communication and, and all of this, the fashion. Like, how do you do this? You know, mm -hmm. so I'm, it's fun for me now. I appreciate, you know, the fact that I learned a lot on my own from the streets, a lot of it. And now I kind of mm -hmm. can impart some knowledge mm -hmm. to some, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. young bucks, you know. So I have to ask you about the block party. Mm -hmm. I love the block party, but for a lot of high parkers, it's challenging mm -hmm. because of the noise level yeah, in the, yeah. you know, but I'm like, this is mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness, yeah. Brooklyn magnified, <laughs> you know, so it's a lot of fun. So I'm like, how do you do that? Like, I mean, how do you plan? Cause it's like thousands of people. There are all 45,000 people last or two years ago. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It, and it was, yeah. Again, it's just so, it's I love it. I yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like, how do you plan for that? Yeah. And how did you graduate? Because I mean, like, you put that on, or maybe mm -hmm. you don't. You put yeah, it on in collaborate. Yeah. How do you do that? How does the, you went from being on the, you know, um, selling items on the street. You have a store. That's one thing. But putting on an event like that, how does mm -hmm. that happen? Well, well, the block party actually started on the north side mm -hmm. uh, because I was part of the Chamber of Commerce in, in, uh, in um, Bucktown, uh, Wicker Wick Park. Mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce and we had this thing called the Wicker Park Fest and every year it would be like no black performers mm -hmm. now as I said before I'm a DJ my friends DJ we had this festival in this neighborhood that supposedly was very diverse and you ain't got no black performers no Puerto Rican we right by Humble Park mm -hmm. we saw something nothing so every year was an excuse of why they didn't have any after a while I'm like I'm not going to keep begging these people mm -hmm. to 
to be a part of the city the way it should be. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can recommend Frankie Knuckles at the time. Like, you can mm-hmm. book, book Frankie Knuckles, you know? Mm-hmm. Always some excuse. So I'm not one to beg. And so I said, okay, cool. I'm not going to ask you anymore. I'll just start my own thing. So I called up some friends, um, mm-hmm. but some people happened to be in town and were pretty well known at the time. Uh, Eric Roberson was a mm-hmm. R&B mm-hmm. singer. He was mm-hmm. in town, and Scott Pevin Everett and Ron Trent, who always plays every year. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to kind of bring different parts of the community together because from having the store, because I did the first block party was in two thousand and three, the store opened in ninety seven. So I had you know five six years of like meeting all these incredible people, mm-hmm. and I realized that some of them didn't know each other. I'm like, you don't know. Girl, she's a great artist, you know, this guy's a good DJ, and, mm-hmm. and my man, he's a ballet dancer, and this mm-hmm. person, this young woman right here, she's an opera singer. So mm-hmm. I kind of, it was a way to bring these people together that didn't know one another. That was actually always a purpose. Mm-hmm. It was to bring together different parts of the city, culturally, that didn't know one another. And I could curate this, this mm-hmm. experience, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it was just phone calls. Hey, I ain't had no money, you know. And so the first time we did it, it was literally maybe 200 people throughout the whole day. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't, it didn't cost me, you know, really any money. I actually had my own equipment. I have photos of this too. Mm-hmm. I built a stage out of cinder blocks and some wood. We just put the block, you know, like those blocks, and that was the stage. Mm-hmm. It wasn't what you see now. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, lived in the, I lived above the store at the time, and we had extension cords that came from my house. I have orange, orange mm-hmm. cords that came down mm-hmm. that ran the power. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, so it was that kind of vibe. We didn't even have porta potties. Mm-hmm. You know, let me use the bathroom. All right, cool. Go in the back of the store. You know, mm-hmm. and so so I did it one year. Two hundred people, and everybody had a great time. You know, you should do this again. You should. And in fact, it was so small. They were saying, "Oh, he should do. You should do it again next week, or next month." <laughs> That's how small it was. You know, uh-huh, uh-huh. and I was like, "Ah, maybe I'll just do it again next year." It wasn't like really. It was fun, but it wasn't like I had this plan to like mm-hmm. did it again next year. And it was like four hundred people came. Mm-hmm. And he did the third the third year. Maybe 800 people came. The fourth year, it was 1,500. Then it just started doubling. Then 2,000 and 5,000 and just started, you know. And then mm-hmm. the last time we did it up here, it was probably about eight or 9,000 people had come to the, on the north side. Mm-hmm. And I moved down here. And the first year I moved down here, I was trying to get settled into the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, you know, I, I knew people, but the store was new. I didn't want to come in and do a big event, mm-hmm. you know. And I was trying to get, like I said, I, I moved in, it was probably April. The block party takes a long time to plan now. So I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to get my store settled, mm-hmm. meet the neighbors, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, maybe the following year. And so uh, everyone was like, we're going to do the block party. And so I didn't do it the first year I came down here. Mm-hmm. And then the next year I did it. And then that just exploded. That's when it was 15,000 people. Then the second year was 20. Then it just kind of just been going, going up crazy. and up. Yeah. yeah. But it was never really meant to be that at all. Because now it costs a lot of money, a lot of logistics, a lot mm-hmm. of time. It was not, it was supposed to be a blog party. Now it's a festival size, 50,000 people. Um, and, and, and to your point, you know, when you mentioned some people don't like it, I, I look at that like life, me being a street vendor. Some people are going to walk past me and be like, hey, you know what, you're going to get that. Mm-hmm. You know, you're never going to do anything that's public that everybody's going to like. Right, right. I know that the greater good, which I, every year I have a different name for the blog party, mm-hmm. one year was the greater good. Mm-hmm. But those 15 or, you know, whatever, 5% of the people, 10% of the people that is too noisy, blah, blah, mm-hmm. you have this 90% of the people is bringing joy, is bringing them money, is mm-hmm. bringing them togetherness, is bringing them community. Mm-hmm. That far outweighs the people who are going to complain. Uh-huh. And it's one day. Come on. Yeah. No, it's two days. <laughs> no, it's only one day. Am I confused? You ain't, yeah. My, my event is one day. It's one day. Okay, I might be getting... <laughs> yeah. the, no, the... No, Bruce, the last day. No, 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 no. The Brewfest is two days. That's a okay, different event. But that, it was that, one that's, day. That's Kim Bark Liquors. His so event not, is two days. Okay. My, okay. my event, one hundred percent, is a one day. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And okay. then you look at the 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 bigger picture. Even if you're a homeowner, the amount of eyeballs it brings to Hyde Park that actually uh, it stabilizes businesses. It brings mm-hmm. them to the community that is beyond just one day. Mm-hmm. You know, people look at this neighborhood now, they, they think the block party. Mm-hmm. That benefits all of us. Mm-hmm. So this one day of inconvenience for some people is benefiting everybody in the, the day. You know, right, and the truth it. is we have other events. But I think, I don't know if it was the Brewfest, like like three events were happening one day. And that might have been the Brewfest where it was the High Park um, 
are uh, you know I, that, that's the brew fest yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's the same weekend that, yeah. that's, that, that, there's just two days and then there was something happening on the university of chicago it was like graduation weekend and so it's like, like you know we live through these winters it's cold outside for half the, the year and we have stuff happening summer you gonna complain about that come on no, I, I i love <laughs> being out with the people so my mom used to say people gonna complain about anything she yeah. would say you, uh, you could win a lottery and complain you won on a Saturday and the bank was closed. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could complain about anything. Just like, you'd be all right, you know. I mean, so you've <laughs> been largely successful in terms of the Silver Room, in terms of the festival, in terms of, you know, just being able to travel the world, write your ticket, being able to bring in staff. Um, where, where, where do you see your future? And, you know, um, do you want to open up another Silver Room? You know, is one enough? Where do you see yourself mm. really going with your your success? Yeah, I mean, I never want to have like a chain silver room. I've been offered opportunity to do it in different cities. Um, it never really was the right time, but now I'm open to doing like a like a more of a um, collaborations. I would say mm -hmm. so. Maybe there's a is an offshoot silver room, but then it's combined with something else. You know, mm -hmm. so but really for me, it's more important to give other folks opportunities. So I'm more interested in like open up spaces mm -hmm. that we can curate markets for other vendors. Okay. So maybe I have a space that might be, let's say six, 7,000 square feet mm -hmm. and we create a market space for 20, 20 vendors in there, you know? Um, that's kind of what we're into right now than me having 20 stores. Uh, I'm opening up uh, a winery in Bronzeville, a wine bar. So that's yours over on Cottage Grove. Because yeah, I, you know, look the, at the windows and I'm like, a yeah. wine, Bronzeville. Yeah. yeah, so that's Silver Room going to have a. That's a, you. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, yeah. Totally you. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah. So I've been working on that the last year. So that actually started before COVID. So we actually got, um, we got an NOF uh, grant from the city. Because uh -huh. I live in Bronzeville uh -huh. and there's nothing really over there in a way, uh -huh. you know? And I'm like, we need a cultural space in our community. It's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. You got working class folks over there. You got middle class folks. You got lower income folks. Don't even matter. We need a place to go and relax, commune, talk to our friends, hang out. We go to North Side Chicago, give money to folks who don't live in the community. You yeah. know, um, yeah. Bronzeville is a solidly middle class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we need a mm -hmm. nice, beautiful space. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm working on right now. So we should be open oh. in the summer. That's exciting. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, really yeah. exciting. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, for me, it's not about necessarily having like a bunch of silver rooms. For me, it's more identifying communities and spaces and what is needed there. So I might do something, maybe it's in South Shore next, that mm -hmm. actually makes sense for that community, you know? Okay. It might be okay. a silver room. It might be something different. I don't know. But like, that's kind of more my interest in just rather than just like replicating and duplicating mm -hmm. this one mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. I think this store fits well here. Mm -hmm. And if it was a silver room somewhere else, it would look differently. It would be responsive to the community mm -hmm. that it's around, you know what I mean? So, you know, the Silver Room in, in Wicker Park was different than this one because it was a different community, you know? Yeah. And if I did one in Evanston, it would, that would look different, you know? I think it's the same kind of energy and mm -hmm. vibe, but the merchandise would probably be a little bit different, yeah. you know? Yeah, Well, I think you're brilliant. I don't know I if don't you know, know it. <laughs> no, I mean, because it's not, I mean, I see a lot of businesses come and go. Yeah. Um, and they say the number of businesses that don't succeed is way larger. Oh, and through COVID, larger. you know, so when you can find a concept and make it work and make it successful. Um, so I think what I hear you saying is that it's important to have art out there. It's important to have community. It's important mm -hmm. to give people a place to. Would you say that your space is more than... Um, more than just selling something. Oh, for sure. You know, that you're trying to provide and give something back as well. Yeah, in the spaces. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I realized that right away. You know, like there's a million, like you said, there's a million retail stores, but how is this different, you know? And and for me, going back to you know, my father and this mm -hmm. idea of community mm -hmm. and like, okay, you can do all those things in the retail space. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier, like the biggest compliment for me is like coming in a store and say, man, it feels good in here. Even when you buy anything, I'm like, okay, I did my job. Like, we yeah. created a space that just kind yeah. of felt good. Like, whatever, the music was playing or the staff was friendly or you looked around. I know people come in, like, I ain't got no money. I'm like, oh, you, you're good. Don't worry about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Wait, what's up? I just want to come in and say what's up to you. You know, that's, that's the kind of vibe that's in there, you know? And if you, yeah. obviously, we had to sell things and make money to stay in business, but that'll come. I don't really yeah. trip on people yeah. who just want to come in and say hi, you know? But it's always been that way. So I think this, this, 
space is uh, it's, it's a cultural center in some ways. It's a yeah, you know yeah. folks use this term safe space. You know that have you know whatever that means. But mm-hmm. um, you know you, you know what I mean. It's a yeah, space right, you, right, right. And I think for me, most important generationally, because for me, you know, I opened the store when I was twenty seven. Now I'm fifty one. You know, mm-hmm. and so opened the store when I was twenty seven. I had a lot of friends that were in their early twenties. Blah blah. Mm-hmm. But I was a mama's boy. My grandmama, you know, she mm-hmm. just died a couple of years ago. She was one hundred and two years old. So I always wanted a space that I could kind of speak to the 20-year-old and the 90-year-old, you mm-hmm. know, and the block party is that same, very intentional. When I hear people say, you know, that the daughter went, the mama went, and the grandmama went, and they all had a good time, that's the biggest compliment because that's done on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I want to have something for everybody because, you know, in our culture, a lot of cultures, you see it's all for young people or it's all for, for elders, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Not many events, and we say when we say all ages, usually all ages actually means like young people, actually, mm-hmm. you know. But again, I know people tell me that was the time that they could go with their their kid, their high school kid, mm-hmm. and they could actually bond over something. They go to and the high school kid wanted to go with them. Now they might go do their own thing, but they wanted to go together. When they leave, they both had fun. And so yeah. that is actually the purpose of this event. So Yeah, yeah. So I have two last questions. I, mm. I feel like I'm at the end and we're supposed to, you know. Yeah, yeah we're, we're good. But we're hey, good. this is fun. This is fun. So for young entrepreneurs, people, I feel like the whole workplace has changed. It's no longer you go to college and you come out and you have this secure job. Mm-hmm. But you really got to hustle and grind and mm-hmm. be creative in the ways you create employment for yourself. So for people that are trying to go into business for themselves, trying to get their hustle on, what words of advice or a three point or a five point sure, do you sure. have for like just navigating those waters? Yeah, I mean, I, w- I would say do a lot of research, mm-hmm. meaning research into what you want to do. Uh, let's say you want to make, you know, I don't know, cameras, you know, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. research Nikon, research mm-hmm. Canon. Mm-hmm. How did they start? Like, who was the owner? What mm-hmm. mistakes did they make? Blah, blah, blah what in the industry right now people looking for in cameras you know like you have to really do a deep dive into what you want to do Mm -hmm. and then try and figure out how you can personalize that and -hmm. put your own edge into that you know Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. why are cameras all black for example why don't you make some gold cameras make Mm -hmm. silver cameras (laughs) you know what i'm saying i'm just like you know like do something a little bit different you know yeah yeah Uh, yeah i'm feeling you you know so so i so that i would say that you know and and think about like in not everybody's meant to be self-employed. Some people don't, they don't really have it in them. You know what I mean? Right, you got to right. be able to kind of like weather the storm, you know? And mm-hmm. again, back when you mentioned when I was a street peddler, i never forget <laughs> my, uh, this guy who got me into a street peddler, you know, we would, we would be making money during the summer and it, I'd make thousand dollars in a day, you know, and he'd be like, and it, I'll be like, I'm about to go home. He goes, man, like these people are still here. You need to make 2,000, 3,000. Cause like a squirrel, like I'm saving them nuts, you know? Mm-hmm. He's like, coming, you know, coming January, there's gonna be nobody out here. You gotta mm-hmm. figure out how to like save this money up, you know? Mm-hmm. And, oh man, I never forget that first January, I was hurting. <laughs> I was hurting. Mm-hmm. And so I remember like, now I need to work, I need to work hard. So mm-hmm. part of that is like, you gotta work hard, mm-hmm. no matter what you do. I never met people who are successful who are just, uh, they don't work, work mm-hmm. hard, you know? Okay. I would um, be honest with yourself, mm-hmm. if you can do with this or not. Um, and you have to be resilient and persevere, you know, and know it's not gonna come, it shouldn't come easy to you, honestly. It's not, that's not how life is, you know, it's gonna be some ups and downs, you know. Um, so those, that would be, those would be my, my little words of wisdom, you know. Okay, so. okay, so, and my last question is, mm. what's on your bucket list, like, on this side of living in life? Yeah. What would you, what, what, what do you wanna do? Uh, I have a 12 year old daughter right now, I'm trying to, Make sure she's educated as you know as best mm-hmm. she can, and kind of show her mm-hmm. everything I can. And like um, you know, I don't I don't think she wants to like win a silver room at this point, you know. But if she did, that's fine. If she doesn't, that's fine too. But I think my main focus is like kind of getting mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. up to speed and then figure out what she wants to do with her life. You know, mm-hmm. as far as like what I'm doing, like I mentioned before, kind of just creating new spaces, mm-hmm. be it mm-hmm. a, a wine bar, be it a you know a museum, or be it you know training facility, whatever it is, mm-hmm. I kind of want to keep busy doing stuff that I find uh, mm-hmm. fulfilling, but definitely tied to helping other people or giving other people a platform. I don't want to just like go do something that's just for me. Like mm-hmm. that's not really, mm-hmm. I don't really get anything from that, you know. Um, at some point I probably want to move. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter's 12, and, you know, maybe 10 years from now, have a couple buildings around the city, 
mm-hmm. maybe go somewhere else and do some of this stuff in another country. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in Chicago my whole life, you know what I mean? So um, that's my 10, 20 year plan is just kind of take it easy, you know, and just not have to work so much. So, so not go to Hawaii or, you know, the Bahamas. Maybe, you know. <laughs> maybe Bahamas, Hawaii, Mexico, probably somewhere a little warmer, uh-huh. you know, and, and just like, you know, do what I do. I know how to do this, so I could do this anywhere now, you know, and just kind of, right. again, like I said, a silver room in, in South America, a little store, I don't want anything crazy, a little big mm-hmm. store, maybe mm-hmm. some apartments above, or else some apartments, just still be able to be creative and like make things and create things and buy things and curate things and just um, chill out. So I think that's, that's the plan. Well, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the winery. Um, even though when I go on saplings, by the time I'm done, I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm a lightweighter. I'm I sorry. Still, you you know. get some water. There's going to be a full restaurant too, by the way. So, oh, yeah, yeah, gosh, yeah. gosh. So I'm looking forward to that opening up. But thank you for giving us your time and thank you for being with us on Crooked Courage. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> thank you.